For those of you that don't know, my name is Mike Flynn, and I am the owner of Ingenious Learning. I was, up until just a few months ago, a proud parent of a Willow Glen Ram. He has now graduated, and he leaves for college in, I believe, nine days, but who's counting? Um, so we are very excited about that, and um, it will be a, a new phase for my wife and I, and you will all be learning about that at some point in your in your lives, possibly, hopefully. Anyway, I have done this for 35 years. Um, I've coached for a total of 37 and been working with kids in terms of test prep, SAT, ACT, tutoring, and college planning, like I said, for 35 years. I've learned a great deal. I've failed a tremendous amount. I've tried to, my father was an engineer and he instilled in me this concept that you know, when you fail, you're still learning something. So I would like to think that with all of the things that I've done and with the thousands of kids that I've pushed through and helped get to college, I've tried to learn a little something on each and every one of them. Um, do I always learn the right thing? And do I sometimes go in the wrong direction when I'm experimenting? Sure. Uh, but that was maybe those first 10 or 15 years. After about really kind of just muddling through for the first 15 years, I think I settled on, hey, this works. And I was able to do that for the next 10. So um, I, we're now at 35. And so these last 10 years, I've stumbled across something new and better. And then the pandemic came along and forced me to really recalibrate what I know and did a tremendous amount of research because I had nothing but time on my hands. And I think that what I've come up with now, um, I would be embarrassed back in the beginning to call myself a college planner compared to what I know now. The mistake that I think that people make is that they go in with, well, we'll see. We'll just see. See what? You're spending a lot of money. I don't think you want to just see and hope for the best. I think that you really want to go into this as a concept of, I know there's no certainty in life and I'm not expecting certainty, but I would like to believe that the things that I've done and the positions that I put my son or daughter into are going to be good ones. And we're going to get some sort of return on our investment. One of the mistakes that I think people make when they go to college is that they look at this as more of an expense you know college is expensive it is expensive and it's really expensive if you do it the wrong way i like to look at it as an investment so i want to be able to pay for my kids college or i share i make them share some burden there's a strategy behind that that we can talk about another day but I look at this as college is not an expense, but college is purely an investment because I'm hoping that they're going to have a different future, not just a better one. I'm looking for something drastically different for them. They could get better just by, you know, um, taking an online class. They could go to the library and they could get better. I really want them to be different. And for the unfortunate amount that, that college costs now, we really need to make certain that we're cautious about the expense here, right? Because it's, it's, it's frightful. Um, now having two children, and as much as you think that you plan and you save, we just had to write our first check for two, and I'll tell you that it was a little bit different. All right, so what the next however long uh, that we're going to talk about um, is the 35 years of knowledge that I've gained and screwed up and figured and twisted and turned and come out with a what I believe is a much better approach and and hopefully you'll you'll feel that same way too. This is a workshop. This is not I would prefer this not to be a straightforward lecture where I talk for you know, an hour, an hour and a half. Many of you know me and you know that I love the sound of my own voice and I've got no issue with that. However, it will be much better if 
you stop and ask questions along the way because this is what this this is a true workshop, right? It's not a seminar. Seminar, you just sit and listen to me and ask a few questions at the end. A workshop, as we go through, go ahead and ask questions. I've got examples to bring up, and if you have a specific example um, about a college or a situation, ask. If it's too narrow, I may I may ask that we take that up at the very end. But if it fits into the general scheme of what we're talking about, um, ask away. So there are five steps on how to pick the perfect college. And the perfect college is not the one you see in a magazine. It's not the one you see online. It's not the one you see in U.S. News and World Reports. The perfect college is the college that fits your child perfectly, right? Um, that's the thing to focus in on. It may be a college that you've never heard of. It may be in a major that you never considered. It might be in a location that was never, ever thought of. And it might be a different format in terms of, oh, wow, I didn't realize that that's what I should be looking at. So keep that in mind as we discuss what the, the five steps are here. So the step one, we have all new rules to learn. COVID changed uh, so much. And they've, um, colleges have been changing on the fly. So in order to adapt and in order to stay on top of these things, you have to learn new rules. Whether COVID or not, the rules that you had used when you got into college, you know, 18 to 35 years ago are different. And you most likely couldn't get into the college that you got into. Right. Just the game has changed that much and and scores and, and grades and all of those other things that the kids need to do are just so much higher now. So we have to learn new rules. Second thing, we have to be able to be influenced by data, but not driven by data. This is a huge aspect. I used to not consider that much data 35 years ago, partly because the data was hard to come by. Then data started to become very easy to come by and I over relied on data and started seeing kids boomerang, which is my term for coming back. And I now recognize that I need to be influenced by the data, but not completely driven. Third thing we're gonna talk about is finding your fit. Next is going to be what it is when you visit a campus, what it is that you need to look for and, and that vibe that you need to see. And then finally, the paradox of choice. Um, so many kids believe and parents that the more colleges we get into, the better. And in reality, it, it, there's, a, there's a point of diminishing return where it works against us. Okay, so step number one, we need to learn new rules. So the very first thing we need to do is that traditional methods no longer work. The traditional methods that you have heard are reach, target and safety. You need to take and X those three out. You need to remove them from your vocabulary. You need to uh, wash your child's mouth out with soap if they, I went to a parochial school, sorry. Uh, old habits are hard to, to break. You need to really just make certain that we don't address this concept of reach, target and safety. There's a number of reasons why, but there's one primary reason why. All three imply that you don't belong. At a REACH school, it's too good and you hope that you get in. And there's a concept that we're going to talk about a little bit later called the um, big fish little pond effect. If I can't compete, but I just got into the school, awesome, you just got into the school, but then you get beaten up on a daily basis academically, it's not a good match. So we want to be careful with this concept of reach. You know, if they're too good for me, maybe it's not that they're any more intelligent, but maybe those people, those kids that are going to that school, um, you know, they're, they're professional students. And what I find from most 17 and 18 year olds that I work with they're not professional students yet. They're still trying to find themselves. They're still trying to figure out themselves emotionally. They've never lived from away from home. There's all number of things here. And why would we want to put a child into a cauldron, right? It just, it, it just doesn't seem to make sense. The next term that's a no, no is a safety school. 
I'm too good for those kids, but if I have to, I'm gonna go there. Really? You're gonna spend a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars on some place that your kid doesn't really want to go? That just doesn't make sense. So both reach and safety are what I would call a mismatch. Right? We'll talk about that concept in a second. I don't want to go to a school that's a mismatch. I want to find a school that matches my skill set. That would be GPA and test scores. So then you go, okay, but my target works, right? Mm -hmm. Almost every kid I know when they give me a list of target schools wants to go to their reach school and never wants to slum it at their safety school. So this concept is, is bad and we want to do away with, with that. And we want to think in terms of two concepts and the two concepts have many sub points. But it's match and fit. And this is where the data influences us. We need to be able to find schools that match my child's GPA and test scores. And there, I, I, said, I said the dirty word test scores, right? ACT and SAT. ACT and SAT scores aren't all bad. There's a number of things that you can hear about them and you can hear that they're um, elitist and racist and, and all of these things. I would love to have a very calm, logical discussion on how the test never knows who you are when you sit down in front of it. The test is the test and it doesn't care. Now, do the schools put and overemphasize those scores? Whereas the school that your child or some child went to maybe not properly prepared? Or is it unfair to think that a kid that's gonna go to a test and just because of a certain thing that they can't take the test? Now that's That to me is actually wrong. So if we're gonna look at GPA, GPA is one discriminator, one way to, for, uh, for colleges to look at schools and for us to see if schools match the needs. But then we also need to use test scores because what test scores tell us is the cohort of students that are going in, we want our child to match or be within a range of that cohort. If the child is not within that range of the cohort, then it's a mismatch. So we wouldn't want, we, we want to put ourselves in, or put our children into situations where they're gonna grow, but we also want to give them that option to grow. And if every single day if they're just getting hammered down upon and they're, you know, the bottom 1%, it, it doesn't work for them. On the other hand, we don't want them to go to the, they, we don't want them to be the top student at a school because there's nothing to grow from, right? That's also a mismatch. So target reach and safety, there's really no way to categorize that. But when we start using some data, we can figure out that, oh, I can use GPA and I can use test scores and I'll give you the websites in a second where you can do that. We can figure out, hey, what's a good match? One quick thing just to recognize, it's better to eliminate colleges that don't match than to try and find all the schools that do match, right? So when I teach SAT and ACT prep, there's four or five answer choices dependent upon the section. And you've got one right answer, three wrong answers. Everyone has spent their whole lives trying to find the right answer. But when it's a multiple choice test, start looking for wrong ones, they're easier to find. I have 100 M&Ms, 20, uh, 20 green and 80 red. I close my eyes and I reach in, chances are I'm gonna grab a red M&M. That's a mismatch. So let's start looking for things to eliminate and it helps us focus very clearly on what the, what the right college would be at that point. When you ask a child, where do you wanna to go to school? I don't know. Okay, where do we not wanna to go to school? Oh, I don't wanna to go to a school where I have a 3.25 I probably am gonna be mismatched if I go to a school that where everyone's a 4.0. Oh, but Mike, you got in. Sure, but what was my experience gonna be like? When I show you some of this data, you're gonna be shocked. On the other hand, I have a 4.0 and the local school that I'm just gonna go there because it's not a big deal, the average GPA there is 3.25. It's a mismatch. Now, can you find happiness? Can you find a way? Sure. 
but I'm trying to play the odds here, right, to really benefit you. Um, I, I don't gamble because I've studied all the odds and you never win. So I studied all the odds for colleges and I looked and said, hmm, those odds are not all that good. Let's see if we can't change the game a little bit so the odds are in our favor. So this is learning new rules. And then um, the ugly stats. So this is, this is the hard part to see that 54% of the students that go to college ever graduate, 54%. So this is graduation. And by the way, graduation doesn't mean four years. The US government classifies it as a six year grad rate. So it's a cute little trick that the colleges did, right? And everyone used to go four years and let's just hypothetically just, I'm an English teacher, so we gotta make the math easy for me. It's a 25,000 a year and I go 25,000 a year, four years, I've spent $100,000, I'm done. Colleges realize that they do a few little things. Now, all of a sudden, you're going five years, you pay 125000 It's a great way to increase their revenue, right? Up their profit. Um, the next stat that you need to recognize is that 30% of the students that go to college drop out within their first year. So we have a six year graduation rate of 54% and we have a 30% uh, chance when we go to drop out as a freshman. Why would we wanna follow that, that safety target and reach approach and, and just go and just shrug our shoulders and hope that it's a, you know, just say, oh, college is an, ex an expense, right? If we look at this as college is an investment and we treat it differently, Hmm. Now, all of a sudden, we're going to have a lot more success. One of the things that people will say to me is, but Mike, you've got no heart. Um, I've often been called a soul, a soul crusher by my students, um, a term I love, but I got plenty of heart. I just got to use it at the right time. I can't be, I, I, I can't be looking and say, oh, I know you want to go to UCLA. Oh, gosh but 168,000 other students applied to UCLA last year. What makes you think you were gonna go? So on a numbers game, you, it's not good for you. No matter where you scored, what your GPA, what, whatever it was that you did, it's just not a really good chance. That's another reason why reach target and safety don't work because the numbers have gone way out of control. So when these schools that have you know, 20 times the, the number of admissions that they used to years ago. How do we calculate whether, the, well, that's not a safety school, but it really is, it, it's not a target school because there's no chance I'm gonna get in because 168,000. So automatically it's a reach school, but wait a second, it's not really a reach school because I match their GPA. So there's all kinds of things there. So the, the, the old rules just don't work and we just need to get rid of that and we need to usher in a new way to think about it. Now would be a great time for a question. I will tell you the chat screen is far away from me and my little teaching studio here, so I can't see it. So if you have a question on what I've just discussed, now would be a great time to unmute yourself and give it a go. Hi, Mike, this is Misty Pickford. Hi, Misty. Um, so recently I was looking at uh, what's required on college applications and it says um, your rank. But then when I talked to Willow Glen High School, they said they don't provide rank because it's not equitable. And I was just wondering, is there a way around that or does that matter or what should I think about that? Yeah, 50% of the, approximately 50% of the colleges in the US, thank you for asking the question. Approximately 50% of the colleges in the US do not offer a rank, San Jose Unified being one of them. Um, so it is a it is a category that you can't fulfill, but technically it's not supposed to work against you. If we were in a situation where there were so few people in the nation who did that, Missy, I'm gonna mute you, or if you wouldn't mind just muting yourself, because I think we're getting some feedback. Um, thank you. If, if there was only a handful of schools across the nation, it would be devastating. But the fact that it was, it's 
uh, schools have got to make an adjustment. With that said, San Jose Unified did something horrible to students. My son was impacted by it, a number of uh, his other uh, classmates and anyone in San Jose Unified. If you were uh, in the um, March of 2020, when uh, all schools got closed down, right? And they went to, it was just a, just a weird situation. It was bad, I, I get that. But San Jose Unified decided to vacate all scores there was not a plus option. There was not a great option. They just abandoned the the, the ranking or the, the GPA um, equivalency that year. That affected kids who were trying to get into the UCs for a number of different reasons. So San Jose Unified is not a perfect situation with a, a number of things, but class rank MISTI is not going to be one that should be a big option for, or should not be a big difficulty for you. Okay, thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Going, going. Don't be bashful. Okay. Second thing is we need to be influenced by data but by not driven, right? So we talked about what the issue here is that you need to find your match and um, my general rule of thumb when we're trying to find a match is we're trying to find, so if hypothetically the college has a GPA of 3.5, right? It's whatever college. I am willing to give a range of plus 0.33 and minus 0.33. So this would be the difference between you know, B plus and B minus, right? So this would be your full range of schools that now you match with. So you go, okay, Mike, that's cool. I have a 4.0. Okay, good for you. So you could go up to a 4.3 and you could go down to a 3.66, right? Minus 3.33. And so this will come into this will come into when colleges take a look at the uh, waiting additional waiting points for AP and honors classes. So if you take a look at UCLA, which is one of the schools where we look at in a little bit, the average GPA I believe is a 4.3. So if you have a 4.0, that's still a possibility for you. If you have a 3.66, that might be a bit too far for you. If you have a 3.25, it's gonna be really hard for you. Now, can you graduate? Sure. Can you go and be incredibly successful? Sure. You can also hit uh, a 20 on blackjack and everyone at the table cringes and you draw an ace and you get 21 and you don't lose. Right, so it is possible, but the question is, is, is it really the right thing to do? The next thing when we take a look at match are test scores and colleges are still publishing test scores. And if they're not publishing the most recent, the colleges just use the previous ones that they, the last ones that they did publish. And we want to look at percentile ranking. So it's real easy to find either the ACT or SAT relative percentile ranking. That's the term you want to search for relative percentile ranking and you have your child take a practice, SAT, ACT, PSAT, whatever, just get a number, just so you have an understanding, a range. And then you wanna be plus 10 or minus 10 percentile points. So if the college is at the 75th percentile, then you would be comfortable at the 85th percentile or the 65th percentile, right? So it's a range. I didn't just make these up. Um, there have been a number of studies, and we'll talk about the big fish little pond effect later, but um, a guy named Mal an author named Malcolm Gladwell, who wrote David and Goliath and Outliers, did a study of medical students and found that the students who performed in the top 10% at Stanford, Harvard, Yale, Med, all had great positive outcomes, not all, had positive outcomes. 
And then he looked at the lesser competitive med schools and the top 10% uh, students there had similar outcomes. Then he looked at the bottom 10% for outcomes at Stanford, Harvard, Yale and the lesser competitive schools and they all had similar outcomes. So the, the conclusion was it's better for me to go be successful in that top third. That's where you're really going to match. And so we want to try and find schools that are going to match your student in the top third. You definitely want to avoid the mismatch, right? Because when we have this mismatch, it's just people are not happy. They're not satisfied. And this is when college becomes an expense, not an investment. And then there's the big fish little pond. Maybe I should make that one earlier in the slide for next time. But I don't want you to go and beat up on all of these students academically because you're so much superior. That's boring. You're going to feel uh, this, like you're not getting what you should from college. I want to send you to a place where you can thrive, you can struggle, you can have all of the range of emotions, but you still have that capacity to grow and expand and, and really become someone different. Uh, when the school is just simply too hard or too easy, then that pathway becomes very narrow. So data is going to influence us, not drive us. And years ago, like I was saying, I relied too much on the data. Hey, you're this, this is what you want to do. So let me switch screens here. And let me show you how we find out some of these things. So I apologize for this is the world's ugliest website. It's not mine. Mine's much prettier, but this one has got horrible, horrible um, uh, user interface. And it's called collegeresults.org. You're going to get an email tomorrow that's just going to say, hey, thanks for coming to my seminar. And it's going to have this link and a couple other links. And I have it reversed just because of this background. So my apologies on the way it looks. But the key data here that we want to look for and where this is how we're using data to influence. So this is going to be San Jose State. You know what? I'm going to hold on a second. Let's use Cal Poly first. So Cal Poly is a very popular school in this area. It's a California school. Everyone seems to be happy there. Um, my big uh, caveat with that is that it does not have it. It's hard to change your major, not impossible, but very hard to change your major. Um, I think as a 17 or 18 year old going to college and someone says, oh, I want to go do this. I know that 80% of students that go to college change their major at least once. And this is harder data to really lock down, but 70% of the, cha the students change their, their majors multiple times. So if someone says, I want to go be a doctor, I go right on. That's awesome. That's really cute that you think that that's going to be the case because there's an 80% chance you're going to change. Hey, I want to go be whatever. I know it's just going to be most likely that you're going to change. So uh, that's the difficulty with Cal Poly that I see. Other than that, great location, great school. Um, be careful with the majors that they do have, right? There's an ag heavy polytechnic aspect, which is great. There's no issue. But if you want more research, Cal Poly may not be the right school for you. So this collegeresults.org, great little website. You look over student success over here on the right-hand side and the first year retention rate, 95%. Great, kids like it there. They stick around, that's awesome. The four-year graduation rate, uh-oh, 45%. Huh, that doesn't seem all that high. Cal Poly is supposed to be this awesome school, but less than half graduated in four years. Okay, but look, it takes a big jump up here in five, year five and six. All right, so this is maybe a five-year school. There are plenty of kids that get out in four, but you're looking at the you're looking at the data. I didn't make it up. This is this is straight from the Department of Education. So we see that okay, maybe that's something to be a little concerned with with a four-year graduation rate. Transfer out rate low, very uh, very low, two point seven. All right, here's where it's going to get a little ugly to see. My apologies. This first one is the incoming average GPA for students, 
All right, you go, awesome, I have a 4.0. Okay, it's a good match. I have a 3.66. Okay, it's still a good match. You're at the tail end, but it's still a good match. I have a 3.25. Cal Poly may not be the right school for you. And you say, but my mom and dad went there. My sibling is going there. My aunts and uncles, everyone went there. I have to go. Who are we picking that college for? Are we picking it for them or are we picking it for you? And that's a very important thing and distinction that you need to make. You're trying to find the college that fits the child, not fits your dream. And that's hard. I can tell you firsthand, having done this twice with my own children. It's a real challenge when that, when that comes up. The one way to try and put this in perspective, because people go, whatever, Mike's got his own opinions, is I would, did not want my parents to pick my wife, and I certainly didn't want my, my mother-in-law to pick my wife's husband because it wasn't gonna be me. So, right, let the child pick and it's gotta fit them. Uh, you can guide them, but it's gotta fit them. All right, the other number that we gotta look at here is SAT scores. So right here we have SAT, verbal, math, and ACT. In purple, it's a little easier to see. Don't look at the median. The median doesn't tell us much. We wanna look at the 75th percentile. And the reason being is because that's what we talked about, right? This is gonna be the best match. So the 75th percentile. So the 75th percentile SAT verbal is gonna be 660 and math is 700. You can go look up and see, hey, what the 65th percentile, what the 85th percentile is. You can find that, that information. Quick Google search, you'll be able to get it. But now all of a sudden you have a good parameter in terms of, huh, my kid's a 3.25 and my kid is an 1100 SAT score, score. Cal Poly might be a mismatch. ACT score, my kid's a 21. You know, the 75th percentile is 31. It, it just may not work. One other number to take a look at is this percent admitted. I want you to take and I want you to completely dismiss the percent admitted number. And the reason why you wanna completely dismiss the percent admitted number is because this is the marketing department. It has little to do with the quality of the college. UCLA knows because they've started to get into magazines that they have more students applying. They're always taking about the same number, accepting the same number, the same number go, but more and more kids go in that just drives their number up on the algorithm for these college search sites. When I show you some of the future outcomes from UCLA, you're gonna wonder, huh, why, why, why do so many people wanna go there? So it is just be really, really careful of that percent admitted. That does not mean anything to do with quality, it, uh, quality for the college, quality for the marketing department, yes. Because if you get a college that's got a 4% uh, acceptance rate, that's a great marketing department really driving up those numbers. So be, just be wary of that. Uh, let's see here. Any questions on, any questions on uh, letting data influence here? Okay, so the third thing we're gonna do is we talked about match and fit, and fit is now where I get to use my heart, right? That, that horrible person that I am, I'm looking at all that data, all that data has eliminated a bunch of colleges that don't fit, and now all of a sudden, I don't match, pardon me, now all of a sudden I need to find things that fit. And there's all kinds of ways to look at fit. One of the ones that we wanna look at will be majors, another is gonna be location, the other is gonna be campus size and culture. And a great website to use is called Big Future, and it's a, it's a college board website. College board is the people that make the SAT. So, you just type in bigfuture.collegeboard.org. Again, this will there'll be a link in the email I send you tomorrow. You go to this part of the menu and the very first one is college search. And 
and you're now taken to uh, a menu where you get four different options. You get a location. So where do you want to go to school, right? All the California kids I know want to go to school in California. My customers in Florida and Chicago and Hawaii want to go to school in California. So California is a popular one, but what I always tell people is that a, uh, if you're only willing to go to school in California, California, the way it's shaped is eight hours north or south, let's go ahead and throw in, let's make a radius there, right, and go all the way around. And now all of a sudden we get Arizona, Oregon, Washington, we can go Nevada. Uh, and I think that's probably a good start. So now all of a sudden you have what was 19, 1990 colleges, I think, by just sorting through the West Coast, we have 303. You can just every bit as easily change this filter and then pick East Coast schools, Midwest schools, wherever. So the filter is pretty cool. And now we have 303 schools, way too many. So we need to now go look at majors, okay? Majors is a funny one because if you just listen to what I was saying, I said that the kids don't really know and they're most likely gonna change. However, we want to give the child the benefit of the doubt that something that they're interested in or something that they're good at is going to help them. So I have a degree in humanities. I have a degree in classical rhetoric, don't ask. Um, but, you know, there's, I, there can only be a handful of programs anymore that, that are in classical rhetoric. Um, so I probably wouldn't want to search for that, but I would say, okay, I'm not a STEM kid. So I would want to make certain that humanities was a big component and I found my way to my major, but I knew I was going to go to a place that had a bunch of different options that were, that were going to fit me. Um, I didn't go to a STEM heavy school because I, that's not who I was. Right, math, math and science and, and me did not get along, but you give me a foreign language, you give me history, you give me English, um, whatever, I was gonna do great with it. So it was just gonna be easier for me to find things that fit. So this is the way you would just simply search for majors. Let's just say that we have a kid that's interested in bio and you just click on this box and now we go add, show colleges, and now I'm from 300 plus colleges, now I'm down to 165. Awesome, I'm getting there, but I'm nowhere close. Now I wanna go type. Well, you want a four-year school and you wanna click public and private. So some of you are saying, hey, what about two-year schools? There's nothing wrong with two-year schools. The hard part with two-year schools that there's a 50% washout rate after one year. So 50% of the students that go to a, a two-year school wash out. I may have said something else. This is a JC. So we're talking junior college, community college, JUCO, uh, whatever you, you want to call it. The 50% of the students that attend on day one are not there on day one of year two. In California, the stats are not really very good because... 16% of the students take three years to graduate and 84% of the students are three plus years. So you can serve, I think you can go into a bar at 21 and serve alcohol. So you can go into the bar, have your child serve you at 21 and then they ask you for some money because they've got to pay their junior college tuition tomorrow. Um, is nothing wrong with the junior college system except that it's just broken, right? They've got to be able to get kids through faster and they're just not. I get a lot of hate mail and a lot of uh, angry angry voicemails that say that I, you know, someone will say, I was a JC student, how could you say that? Again, nothing wrong with the JC system the JC system is just broken the way it's currently set up and their outcomes, right? Their outcomes are bad. The other thing that we look at for colleges would be public or private. And people say, Mike, I'm, I'm not gonna pay private school prices. It's too pricey. That's fine. But often we look at public school prices that are taking five, five and a half, six years 
to graduate, often private schools, there is money to be um, uh, had there, right? Uh, in terms of scholarships or aid or however you want to classify it, it's still money your way, so it's cheaper. And so a four-year graduation rate at a private school could end up being the same or cheaper than going to a public school, even though the public school is cheaper per year. But you just have to go more years. The other thing that I will tell you that if you are in a, in a public school or a school that's going five and a half years, um, there's an opportunity cost. So my older son, school he's going to, he just is completing his internship this summer, has a job offer. You know, he'll graduate next year, go to Europe for six weeks, then come back and already have a job. It's going to be for him, he's earning a living right there, technically day one of, you know, after he graduates. Whereas a lot of the kids that he went to school with who maybe are not as fortunate going to a public school, they didn't know whatever the situation may be, they still have a year and a half. So really the numbers start changing dramatically once you get a kid that's starting to earn a living. So um, what I suggest to people when you're searching on the site is you click four year and you click public, uh, excuse me, public and private. Okay, we show colleges. All right, we're now down to 107. Hey, that's where we're getting closer. Uh, don't look at the affordability one. Um, I don't find it to be in a very efficient filter. I'm all for affordability in college. I think it's way too expensive, but it is not a good filter. So we skip that one. Okay, then we go to campus life. And the very first one we're gonna look at here is size of campus. So there's four options. This is called the Carnegie classification. And I don't know how they settle on them, but they did. So what I always tell people is that you click the middle two, right? Because if you say, I wanna to go to a small school and you only pick you know, these, you might miss out on a school that's 9,001. So if you wanna to go to a small school, I say pick the top three. If you wanna to go to a big school, I say take the bottom three. I think that's the best way that I've had the most success sorting colleges this way. Kind of the similar philosophy goes for picking setting. I would always, if you say that, hey, I wanna live in more of a suburban urban type setting, let's pick the top, two, or sorry, not even suburban. I wanna live in an urban setting, I'm gonna say pick the top two. I want a rural setting, I'm gonna say pick the bottom two. Again, this is kind of subjective in terms of where they are. Um, anyway, that I think will just help you out. So uh, that's really all we need to do there. We, kick sh we hit show colleges and now we're down to 37 colleges. And then we have the colleges listed right here where they are and you're able to start sorting and searching for that. So Big Future is an excellent way to go about finding a big number of colleges off of a handful of filters. I can get a list of 100 colleges within two minutes, right? I've done this enough that I just know I can get a list of 100 colleges as a starting point if someone wanted to do biology. Okay, they're not interested in biology and they're interested in screenwriting. So we click show colleges and, uh-oh, in California, there's only four. So now I would have to decide, gosh, I need more than just four colleges to sort. Okay, I need to go back and play with one of these other major or other filters and it's almost always gonna be location, right? I need to expand that out beyond just Pepperdine and Chapman and Loyola Marymount and Fullerton. So that's the college search function. It's a great website, gives you a lot of information. And then you go and you take some of this information and you plug it into this ugly website, College Results Online. Right, so let's take a look at a school like Chapman, because we just did screenwriting. So Chapman is in Orange County. Um, if you live in or know the Willow Glen area, Orange County looks a lot like Willow Glen. And in fact, when you walk outside the campus from um, uh, Chapman, there's a little restaurant on the corner that I swear that it could have been a Starbucks and it's got the exact same downtown feel. 
So there are a lot of kids from Willow Glen that like that campus because it feels very comfortable. Feels comfortable today, but is it going to feel comfortable tomorrow in four years, right? That's a big thing to consider. Um, I use the baby shoe analogy. When you were buying baby shoes for your baby, you didn't buy shoes that fit today. You bought them a size too big so that they could grow into them, right? That's that's the trick. So if you buy, if you buy the school that fits perfectly today, will your child be allowed to grow into that? So we plug in, we go to Chapman and we say, okay, look at this. First year retention rate, 89%. Uh, the, that means 11% of the kids washed out after first year. Any number above 85 is okay by me. National average is 75. The four-year graduation rate, 69.3%. Hmm. Okay. You know, close to 70, not bad. 76% for five-year. Uh, the average GPA is 3.71. You're looking at 75th percentile SAT scores. Okay, so I have that information. And then all of a sudden I look at the amount of money I gotta pay, and this is not updated. I was on a call for Chapman, uh, I don't know, sometime within the last six months, and they said that this incoming group of students that will start in the next couple of weeks, the tuition will be $80,000. Chapman has been regularly going up and following CPI, cost to consumer price index amounts, sometimes a little higher. Um, inflation's high this year. You know, it's projected that you could pay $100,000 in your senior year at Chapman. So now you've got to say, wait a second, I'm going to pay eighty, ninety, dollars dollars $100,000 and I'm not going to get anything better than a 69% graduation rate? That's that's bothersome. I don't know if that fits for me. So this is why we let data influence us. If you want to go into film, film production, it's, you know, 96 percent of the students that apply to Chapman get eliminated at the film production school. So it's a hot, hot commodity for film. But maybe some of the other ones, it's not as good of a fit or whatever. Right. Um, every kid fits in a different place but you just do have to take into consideration some of these things. And then sometimes people say, Mike, you focus too much on money. Well, we always have some money that maybe we invest in stocks, kind of like, oh, I thought that was gonna be good. But if you're so lucky to have 200 grand and you can just push it into any stock on the stock market and go, well, we'll see. Then I don't know why you're on a free call. Right, that's not the way it goes. So anyway, that's that's how you would use the Big Future website, getting a bunch of call schools, then you would go into the college results and look at that. Let's do a little bit more. Let's take a look at a local school, San Jose State. So there's nothing wrong with San Jose State. You may have gone there that's great. You might have a child that's going there. That's fantastic. I'm not talking badly about the education you can get there. I'm talking badly about the outcomes and what's the the transactional concept that San Jose State is currently under. Most of the CSUs are under a transactional concept. You pay money, they give you a class. They're not necessarily going to give you a degree. First year retention rate for San Jose State is 87%. Okay. So 13% of the kids wash out. Remember, we were at Cal Poly, it was like 97 or 94. And then we were at Chapman, it was, what did I say, 89 or whatever. And now we're at San Jose State, 87. And you go, hey, state school, cool, awesome, cheaper, no big deal, 87, I'm willing to take that risk. All right, so be it. But then we look at the four-year graduation rate. Four-year graduation rate at San Jose State is 10%. The five-year graduation rate is 41%. Six-year graduation rate, only 56%. Pre-pandemic, this number was 48.8. So I don't know if everyone just had time to, to sit and catch up on all their classes over the lockdown, but that number rose dramatically over the last couple of years. But we're now looking at a school that has a 10% four-year graduation rate. We look at the average GPA, 3.4. So if you have a child that's at around a 3.6, hey, the school matches. 
If you have a child that's around a 3.2, the school matches. I have a child that's got 600 and 600 on SAT or 24 on an ACT. Hey, this school matches. So a lot of the data is really great for this school. But this is the data. These are the data points that scare me right there. Any questions on this? If you don't have questions, on, I don't think you're listening. Yes, go ahead. How often is that data updated? Um, so, uh, like, I'm going to show you my website, which I get straight from the Department of Education. It's updated every single year. The college results, so this is what's the the... the the mistake that people make, they go, oh, they're using outdated outdated data. Look at that, it says graduation rate 2018. We're in 2022, Mike, your data's wrong. No, remember, they're looking at cohort data. When that cohort entered, what was their graduation rate four years, five years, six years later? So that's why there's a lag on some of that data. Now, you might say, I have a friend that's a professor, and I know for a fact that it's now 14.6% for your graduation rate. It's awesome. That's better than 10.8, but still not good. Answer your question, Susan? Good, bad. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Hi, Mike. This is Kate. Hi, Kate. I would love your feedback on um, not staying in California and getting the hell out of the state for a kid. Um, it Bo appears. Both of my boys go to school in Indiana, Kate. <laughs> That's yeah. well, I can't I, I can't tell you anything stronger than that. Than that. Well, we're looking a little bit farther east, but um, admissions wise, before you just told us to like dismiss the marketing of acceptance rates. It does seem like when I'm looking out of state, those states want their own kids in school and don't totally love the out of staters, at least by acceptance rate data. Are you looking at it's Michigan not, by by chance? Michigan, um, North Carolina, Duke, Virginia, Maryland. I don't know. The, so I'm just curious what you think of the out of state ad admission rate, and should we just scratch it? So, right, it's a scatter plot. Right, green is green is good, and red is bad. And uh, one of the websites I have that uses this, the scatter plot with these two colors. And there's a kid that's got a 4.0 and a 1450 that got rejected, and a kid that got a 4.0, 1450, and got accepted. Yeah. So what does the acceptance rate tell you there? Doesn't, yeah. doesn't tell you anything, unfortunately, right? That's why that number, that's why that's a, that's a number that I used to look at, and now it's, oh, that's nice, cute, go ahead, move on. Yeah, I go back to the, um, the fit. Yeah. Okay. So okay. If, if, Duke, if Duke and Michigan, right, how did I know Michigan, right? Because that's, that's one, that's a tough one. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's a lottery pick. A lot of these colleges, unfortunately, become lottery picks. Lottery picks for the out-of-staters. No, lottery, well, try California. Look at the lottery. Take a look at the lottery picks for California kids. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's just, okay. it's, it's, an unfortunate, it's an unfortunate situation that our children find, ourselves in, find themselves in. And my, my job, my mission, my goal is to create a situation where we can find them a school that really fits and we just know that it is going to be lottery pick. Lottery. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Sure. Any other, Any other questions? Questions. It's Kevin Holtquist. I was wondering not to harp on a on the acceptance rates, but so you just went by Chapman there and it was 50 plus percent. Can you just speak to what that means? I understand the UCLA issue and the, you know, the lottery system and the, that's a marketing thing, but what does it mean for a school at 58, 59%? So let, let's take, uh, can I, could you, uh, could you mute yourself there? Cause I'm getting some feedback getting and then just pop back on. Thank you. So, uh, um, University of Oregon, 
is a school that I will often recommend for kids. I think it's got, there's a number of things on, on that school that I really like, and they have a slightly different mission. Their mission is gonna say, listen, we're gonna let you in, and if it's the right fit for you, you're gonna come on in, and if it's not the right fit for you, then you won't come or whatever, right? So, you know, their average GPA, 3.58, their, their 75th percentile scores, 12, 1220, their five-year graduation rate is not all that high. That's a little disappointing for me, honestly. I wish that that number was higher. I don't know why it isn't. First-year retention rate is acceptable, right? My number is 85th percent. This is the number that kills me, 19.7 transfer out rate. I'm 100% convinced it's weather related, that it's hard for people to accept that. Once you get past that and you know, you know it's gonna rain sometimes, okay, a lot of time, then you're gonna be okay. But their acceptance rate or percent admitted is 77.8%. So everyone believes that Oregon is a no good school because it accepts almost 80% of the students. But that's not the case because I just showed you that we have nearly a 3.6 and we have 75th percentile scores of 1210. So it just could be that someone that's applying to Oregon is applying to Oregon because they thought that it was gonna be a good fit. And it wasn't just one of those schools that just everyone just clicked off. You know, the other aspect too, the UCs and the CSUs have made it super convenient just to click a button and just send your money and, and apply. Super easy and super cool for the kids and great for the colleges that wanna show that they, it's really hard to get in. So percent admitted, in, from my perspective, doesn't mean anything. You could talk to another college counselor and they may have a completely different take on it. And I'll tell you that they're 100% wrong and that they're trying to drum up this concept of exclusivity. That's not the case, it's outcomes. Always think about outcomes. What are the outcomes of the school? Um, I don't know, did that answer your question, Kevin? It did, thank you, and I promise never to look at acceptance rates again. No, I do too, no, I right? Do it's too. just one of those things, it just, it's hard though. So I, I but it, it's, it's the reason why, right? That's always the thing is always look at why. Um, again, that even though I have, I was an English teacher and have a degree in humanities, my father was an engineer and he trained me to always question things. So I'm always looking at him too. Any other questions on, I don't even know what topic we were on, finding, finding your fit. Hey Mike, it's Alicia. Hi Alicia. I just want to say that Elliot went through this whole thing with you and you provided him amazing guidance. I'll pay he you later. Loves, <laughs> yeah, right. Um, he loves University of Oregon and I just want to say school is amazing. And the other thing I will say is it does rain a lot, but it doesn't rain all the time. We were really surprised. It'll rain for a couple hours and then clear up. So. I just want to put away the myth that it rains all the time. Go Ducks. Elliot, like, it's not that bad. Like, it'll rain, but then the sun comes out, and he's, he's really happy. Amazing school, amazing faculty, amazing support. We're totally happy. Thank you. I appreciate you saying that. Um, I appreciate what you said about, you know, his the, how he's been going and, and that I did help. Um, if I will tell everyone who will listen, uh, I visited a lot of colleges. If I could go to any college, it would be Oregon. Um, I did everything wrong in college, and I want a, if I were to go back, I want a different college experience, and, and Oregon has got that experience for me. So I'm glad he's having such a good time. Any other questions? Okay, so let's move through. So we talked about finding fit. Oh, let's talk about culture real quick. Um, culture is just a word that was an alliteration for campus, so I just had to find something. I don't really know if culture is the right word, but when, when you go to a college to visit, and we talk about the, 
the campus visit next. Let's fact, let's do that now. Um, oh, hold on, we'll come to this. So when we talk about the campus visit, you want to make certain that when you walk onto that campus, you feel like you fit in. And I'm not saying that everyone has to look like you. I'm just saying that you could look and you could see yourself at some point. Um, not all colleges do that and not all colleges have that same sense. And there is a there's a um, some kids struggle to kind of go. I, I don't I never felt like I found my footing. So, like I said, I did everything wrong in college. Um, I, like so many, right, I had to pay for college myself. Um, I needed to get out of the house. So the closest place that I could go that was, I grew up in San Jose, was San Francisco State. So went to San Francisco State. I visited on a Sunday. There were no kids on campus. I looked at the buildings. I go, looks cool. I'm in San Francisco. That's got to be great. Not knowing that. I was really almost in Daly City because Daly City is right across the street and that I was a 20 minute train or 30 minute uh, trolley ride to get to any fun part of San Francisco. And then the other thing, um, it was always, always cloudy and misty and foggy and cold. And I show up, I went to school at Leland. Um, it's the mid eighties. I got a white sweater, acid wash jeans some white tennis shoes, cause that's what I just left Leland Almaden looking at. And I get to my first day on the San Francisco State campus and everyone is wearing black. Everyone's got uh, long hair. There's eye makeup going on. Um, there's protest every single day. Um, I wish I had gone and visited the school when there were people on campus because maybe I would have chosen something different. All of my friends that I have growing up are from high school. I don't have a single friend from college, right? Just the way it goes. I'm not looking for uh, sympathy. It's just that I didn't have that experience because I didn't find my fit. I just powered through to get my degree so I could move on to something else. But I would give just about anything to go back and find a place where I have maybe the culture of the, something that would fit me. Um, maybe I... Maybe I um, should have had a more open mind and started uh, uh, wearing more black and eye makeup, but that just wasn't who I was. Okay, let's talk about the campus visit. So step four, when you go to a campus visit, you know, there's a couple questions you got to ask yourself and you really want to make certain that you do fit in. Um, you don't have to fit perfectly, right? Because we've got to have some room to grow, but you don't want to be, and this is me, right? I was this person. This, this image here is the perfect image of me. I, I did not fit. So how does it fit today? We talked a little bit about that baby shoe concept. Um, when you go to the campus and, and it's more than just a visit, it's looking at everything about it. Uh, do I have room to grow? Are there going to be majors? If we know that 80% of the kids are going to change their major, is there going to be a way for me to change if I need to? If I can't, or it's almost impossible to change, then that school's maybe not a good fit and that campus isn't going to really, it's not going to be a good thing for me. On the other hand, uh, there are some schools, University of Washington, uh, Purdue, there's a, a number of schools that do this. It's not unique just to those two that you don't really pick a major. You apply to a department and then you go through their first year set of classes. And at the end of the first year, you then get to apply to the major. And some people go, oh, that's, you know, my son wants to go into aerospace, which my kid wanted to go into aerospace and at Purdue. And it's a really great program. Well, he doesn't get to go right into aerospace. He has to go into the engineering department. Then he's got to fight it out amongst all of the other aerospace engineers and aerospace at Purdue is that's their top program. He's got to then slug it out. And if he's not one of the top kids, he doesn't get to be aerospace. Okay. Fortunately, right. Did that work out well for him? He was able to, to compete, but if he didn't compete, what a blessing, what an absolute blessing that he learned in his very first year, he didn't match and that he would have gone into another engineering field or maybe just left engineering completely and then applied to another another college in, you know, another department in that campus. Um, 
But I, I look at these things that colleges do, people say, oh gosh, that's not comforting. I wanna make certain, no, no, that's fantastic. What a wonderful gift the college is giving you. It's, it's helping you preserve your investment. Because if they just let you go right into aerospace and he's the very last kid, right? Is that, is that gonna be satisfying? Is that gonna be that college experience that he wants? And, and I don't think so. So I'm, I'm hard on a lot of colleges for a lot of different reasons, but there's a number of things that they do well. They're great at keeping your money. And if you look at the business model, how am I gonna be able to get a kid to go through and stay with that? you know, schools like UW or Purdue or a handful of other schools that, that you applied to this, this concept is I think really fantastic. So how do I fit today? Well, I wanna be in aerospace today. I wanna be a screenwriter today. I wanna be in business today. I wanna be in biology today, well, bio, bioengineering, biomedical engineering, pardon me. Okay, well, we know 80% are gonna change, so I've gotta be able to, to, to have that concept, but is there going to be something else if I recognize, gosh, that doesn't fit so perfectly, but maybe I need to get a minor? You know, and Alicia, to your point about Oregon, one of the things that Oregon has done that I think is brilliant, they've recognized that the outcomes of students for, that are graduating, and so they're doing a lot of hybrid degrees. So if you get a degree in physics at Oregon, they're going to make you do a hybrid degree in biology so that you now are very employable when you come out. And uh, that's such a huge deal. So you want to look for these colleges that are thinking kind of outside of the box and doing that. So after my first year, I've got through, I figured stuff out. How does this school fit? And one of the big complaints with the smaller school kids is it's starting to get a little small. So kids will outgrow a bed, they'll outgrow shoes, they'll outgrow friends it's not uncommon or unexpected for them to outgrow a college. They outgrew the high school. And maybe some kids always, you know, they love that high school experience, but at some point we got to move on. So as big of a school as Purdue is and as happy as I am for it for my older son, he's now going to be a senior and he's already looking forward to getting out because he knows he's got a job, right? He's already starting to outgrow it. Thank God he's outgrowing it in his fourth year and not in his first or second year. And then that's a completely different thing. So when you go make this campus visit, these are some of the things that you're looking at. How do I feel like I fit in? What are the programs like today that are perfect for me? What are the programs gonna look like tomorrow for me? And then do you see yourself there? Um, so I tell the story all the time. If you've heard it before, my apologies. Uh, I've, read, I've got multiple centers and one of my centers is up in Cupertino and I had these two boys, Sean and Paul Raj. Um, I had them for maybe eight or nine years, right? I watched them grow up and they were Sikhs. So um, at some point, Paul Raj decided I'm still gonna continue. I'm gonna practice the religion, but this younger brother changed his name and now he goes by Sean. He kind of renounced his uh, his name and wanted and shaved his head and was completely different. So I now have A to Z. I got two kids going this completely different directions. Sean goes in and he looks every bit as, as like any other kid, right? And he's gonna fit in at any campus he goes to. But Paul Raj, because he was wearing a turban, felt that he needed to fit in differently. And so he was really struggling with where to go. And this was long, long time ago when I uh, was helping him, right? I've learned a lot since then. And the two schools he got into because he wanted to go into sports management were um, uh, sports management for cricket players, no less. Uh, the two schools he got into were University of San Francisco and St. Mary's in Moraga. So he's down to the national day where you've got to turn in your deposit is May 1st. It's you can't, you have to turn it in by May 1st. That's the, the end of the road. If you don't, right, you lose your space. And Paul Raj calls me in a panic and says, Mike, you've, I, I can't decide. You've got to help me. And my number one rule is I never decide for colleges. It's all them, right? I help kids do this. And out of desperation, because I could tell Paul Raj was panicking, I go, Paul Raj, just go to St. Mary's. Every kid I send there loves it. Paul Rush drives to St. Mary's, walks on campus, calls me and says, Mike, I don't look like anyone here. Because he didn't really fit in there. 
immediately told Paul Raj, get in your car, drive to San Francisco, you'll make it before five, turn in your deposit, because that's where you're gonna fit in. So you never let someone else try and tell you where you're gonna fit in. The kids have to see where they're gonna fit in, right? Just like you don't pick their, their spouse, you don't wanna pick their college. So the way to do that is to make certain that does it fit today? Because I have to be happy. I gotta make it through that first year because we know 30% wash out. I gotta make it through tomorrow. It's gotta have room to grow. And do I see myself here and can I, can I change enough if I need to? Um, I, by the way, write a newsletter, it's free. You can sign up for it. I'll send that link to you too. But I talk about how to visit a campus and not waste thousands of dollars um, with a teenager, right? Because kids are gonna not really be into it. And I have some strategies for how to make them more into it. Okay, finally, the final step is this paradox of choice. And it's the more ugly stats, um, the concept of exploratory studies and undecided isn't bad. So let's take a look at some ugly stats here. And I have on my website, a shameless plug. You go up to my website, you go to college prep and you go, is college worth the cost? And I have what I call as an expense or investment calculator. And I studied a lot of data because I had this time over the lockdown to do this. And I came up with three numbers, five, 10, and 20. And five is the grad rate. So I need a college, the numbers I need to see have to be 70% or better at the five-year grad rate. If I'm below 70%, the national average is 63.8%, by the way. So if I'm below 70% for a five-year grad rate, I have to question, is this a school I wanna to go to? 10 is when the ROI turns positive. So ROI stands return on investment. So this is the total amount of money that you put into college. Will the amount of money that my child, if they get a job after they graduate at age 23, right? Because five years, we have to use some, some numbers here. After 10 years, will their return on investment be positive? And then 20 is the 20 year outlook. What does the outlook look like for 20 years? Because if you're gonna invest 100 to $200,000, I need to get them out. I want them to have a, a job where the ROI is gonna be positive. And I need to make certain that they're not looking for a new career in five years because the career that they signed up for washed out. If anyone is in journalism, I apologize in advance for this, but I believe that a journalist now is someone that's considered to have an iPhone and a Twitter account. And if you went to school and you spent a lot of money and you got out with a degree in journalism that it's not a field that's gonna be the same. Engineering, medicine, those always have great steady outcomes, cryptocurrency, electric cars, gaming, huge upside, right? So this is how that 5, 10, 20 works. Five stands for 70% above graduation rate. 10 stands for my ROI has to turn positive before age 33. And then the 20 is what's my 20 year outlook. Okay, so I took 30,000 majors at all the four year colleges and put them into this chart. How do I make myself go away here? So um, I would encourage you to go to, here, I'll put this in the chat. There, if you click on that link in the chat, you should be able to get into the chat at the bottom right. Um, and you can, you can go onto that website and it'll take you right to this page. Anyway, you're gonna see a couple things to notice right off the top that you're able to touch these uh, column headings and sort. So you can sort by which degree is going to give me the highest lifetime return on investment, which degree is gonna give me the absolute lowest uh, degree of an on investment. Uh, you can really auger in here with that. Um, you know, look, some of these schools, the, the ROI never turns positive. And some of these schools, the ROI turns positive you know, within a year or two, 
right? They're 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 just minting kids, graduation rates, and then the major. So we talked about UCLA earlier, and people think that I'm a uh, a basher of the UC system, and it's I'm not. I'm a realist. So I'm going to type in Los Angeles here, and it's going to give me the University of California at Los Angeles. And now here are all of the majors at UCLA. The grad rate, look at the grad rates, awesome. 89% over five years, right? That's terrific. And if you're in computer and information science, you're, I got to really move out of the way here, sorry. Computer information uh, science, your ROI is positive at 24, so it's a great investment. After 20 years, you're looking at 200,000. Now, I know we live in a weird area. This is national data, so just realize that. And then my lifetime return on investment is 2.8. Okay, UCLA is awesome. Mike, what are you complaining about? Look, I go into computer engineering, I'm 2.6. I go into nursing, I'm 1.7. Wow, that's a big drop off there between engineering and nursing. But look, nursing stands tall, right? Third at UCLA. Electrical engineering, aerospace. Oh, look at that. Okay, 1.3. All right, we go down and there's gonna be 25 schools per page and there's three pages here. So I know UCLA has 54 majors total. So let's go back up to page one here. Oops. And now I'm going to sort, I'm gonna use this handy sort feature and I'm gonna double click on this one and I'm gonna get the lowest return on investment, lifetime return on investment from UCLA. Okay, if I get a degree in dance, after 20 years I'm earning 21,000, my ROI never turns positive and I'm minus 480. Okay, that's dance, Mike, if that's a passion thing, right? That's not fair, okay, music, okay, another one. Classic and ancient studies, this is my degree, classical rhetoric, okay, never positive. Physiology, hmm, sounds STEMI, I would think that that would be better. Geology, STEMI, architecture, oh, that's interesting. I thought architects did well. History, okay, well, what you gonna be? You're gonna be a history teacher, right? Area studies, not certain what area studies is. Research and experimental psychology, Oh my gosh, biology, a STEM program, still lifetime negative. Fine and studio arts, you weren't counting, but I was, that's 11 out of 54 majors has a negative return on investment for the lifetime. But it gets worse. Okay, even though this is positive, a career lifetime improvement of 8,000 is nothing to write home about. And in fact, it takes me all the way down to 20 20 different schools until my lifetime return on investment is over $100,000. Yet 168,000 students applied to UCLA because they had to go there. Why did you have to go there? Well, if you wanna go for, you want to go for computer and information sciences, it's going to be a pretty good school for you. It's going to be a great school. But knowing that 80% of the people change their major, if you go only for this and you can't find another program that you're interested in, UCLA may not be a good fit. So let's take a look at nursing, because we saw that nursing, UCLA nursing was number three in the country. Um, Okay, so this is all the nursing programs. And it's Unitech College, which is somewhere in the East Bay, 2.6. Cal State East Bay, Cal State Sacramento, Sonoma State, San Francisco State, Stanislaus, University of Providence, Mercy, Dominguez Hills, Chico, University of San Francisco. Notice San Jose State, and there's one more CSU, Cal State Northridge, 
and then at the at the number 25 is NYU. Notice that UCLA does not show up as a as a nursing program in the top 25 in the nation, but 10 CSUs do. 10 CSU colleges show up in the top 25 for for nursing. Um I always show this one just because it's interesting. Everyone bashes Chico. Chico has a good nursing program. And if you want to go into construction management, it's the top program in the nation there as well. There's Cal State East Bay again. So if you want to be a nurse or construction management, you're, you're going to be awesome if you go to one of these schools. But the downside, right, look at the grad rates. So this is why we have to let data influence us. We can't let data, data drive us. Because if we only look at grad rates, we're going to get a number. If we only look at outcomes, we're going to get a different number. We have to use all of those things. We eliminate schools that don't fit, and then we use fit to, to follow our heart and our, our, our soul, what's going to work for me. So those are the ugly stats, right? You go to, like I said, my website, you look at all those other ones, you're just going to see, my gosh, is college worth it? Yes, it can be, but you have to find the right place. That's the critical thing. That's why you just didn't shrug your shoulders. Oh, it'll, it'll be fine. It'll work out. It's just too expensive to, to just say that anymore. I'm a huge fan of exploratory studies. Some colleges have an exploratory studies, exploratory studies program that their job is to take and each week introduce you to a broader set of, of different skills and majors. And what it's going to allow you to do is to find the one that fits you. And the only way you get that is from exploring. So I'm a big believer that college is all about finding yourself. And if you can't find yourself at a college because the college doesn't let you change a major, I'm not a believer in that one. Right? The stats are too ugly. And then I just know, because I've been working with kids for 35 years, you change your mind. And then finally, undecided is not a horrible thing. Right, so exploratory studies programs are designed to let you really go without adding what's the the, the term is called uh, adding time to graduation. It, exploratory studies are very specific about I'm going to get you out in four years, not have you add time. We're going to keep you on a couple different tracks so that you're going to be successful, but we're going to let you go and explore and figure things out. I'm a huge believer in that program. But if the school that you end up going to doesn't have exploratory studies, undecided isn't a bad way to go. Because, again, you don't know, I think, based on statistics, that you're going to know where you're going to end up. Kate, you're going to say, hey, wait a second, Mike. That's all well and good. They're making my kid pick a major. Right? I think Michigan is going to force a major on you. Um if that's the case, then you've got to play that game, but you just better hope that you're able to switch. It felt like most of those schools had the big broad, um, I don't know the right word for it, but huge groupings of majors and you could go into that one big school, liberal arts, studies, blank, blank, and then choose. Yeah, I think that's the only way to go, honestly. I hear you say undecided is not, um, I mean, they're damn 16 and 17. Who the hell is decided, for no. God's sake? I, I, I don't know what I want to be, I right? I'm... I've, I've been, uh, over the pandemic, I, you know, I'm trying to look at, okay, what's going to happen in the, the next phase of my career as I get older. And so I've been doing a ton of writing online thinking, well, that's going to be my next thing. And I'm like, oh, it's kind of fun. I like that. So I'm at 55 and I'm still changing my mind at what I want to be when I grow up. Right. Imagine that you're 16. So it, it, it's just, it's, it's a, it's a nasty situation when they just force you and my suggestion, I hate mandates, don't, don't make me get subjected to that. So that's the thing, you have to, you have to take, that was that number one slide, right? With the old rules, we have to learn new rules. You're either gonna be a convert to the way that I do things and you're gonna go, okay, Mike, I see the light. Or you're gonna go, no, I think he's wrong. And if that's the case, then I encourage you to read 
my newsletter. I encourage you to read the stuff on my website, follow me on Twitter, and read what I say versus what other college planners say. And after you hear it enough times, you're gonna go, wow, yeah, they're not right. You don't have to say I'm right, but you can really gonna say, you can say I'm not wrong, but you're definitely gonna start saying these other college planners are not right. And I get into, I'm, I get hey, into Mike. fights with them, so. Hey, Mike? <laughs> yes. Uh, Dana Hooper. Hi, Dana. Question. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, I guess it's a data question, but I'm looking for an explanation, you know, for why the San Jose State has a 10%. And I'm wondering, are, are there a lot of people, um, students at a school like that, that are working full time and, um, going to school and stretching it out over multiple years? So the answer is yes, right? You say, hey, we live in Silicon Valley and I can get a job there and it's a commuter school and you should be able to look and see Cal State Long Beach, that's a commuter school. Cal State Fullerton, that's gonna be a commuter school. Um, my my uh, uncle lives in Fullerton and I took my son, when we were visiting colleges, we were looking at schools down south and we said, hey, let's go see Uncle Mickey and we're gonna go check out Cal State Fullerton. The outside of Cal State Fullerton's campus is a giant ring of parking spaces. And I think that the, I counted, because they had the signs, just the, just the parking spaces we see without going all the way around had 23,000 parking spaces. So that's a commuter school. But the issue is why do I wanna put myself, if I have a choice, if I have a chance to go someplace else, why would I put myself into that situation, right? Now, it might be, listen, and this is for my godson, uh, there's some issues there, he's not ready to go away, San Jose State's gonna be the perfect place for him to kind of work through his issues, his parents can be close by, they can observe. All of that stuff is fantastic, and San Jose State fits him, right? It's not a great match, but it fits him, and ultimately that's the thing that, that really needs to happen. That's why we let that data influence us. But when I look at the, many of the CSUs, there's 23 CSU campuses. There's only about five that I would recommend sending your child to. And it's because that the CSUs have become very transactional. And the definition of a transactional school is when, this is my definition, right? Grad rates down, and incoming students up. So if San Jose State's grad rates continue to go down, but they continue to accept more students, they're not interested in a transformational experience for Bennett. They're interested in a transactional experience for Bennett. Let's keep this kid five, six, seven years. Let's keep him on the payroll. You know, he's gonna get some classes, but we're now looking at what I would call incremental gains instead of exponential. So what are the five schools? Uh, well, Cal Poly, San Diego State, um, um, Chico for nursing and for uh, construction management, uh, Long Beach, I'm at four, what's my fifth one, Sonoma? Now, someone will say, Mike, what about Fullerton? What about uh, Dominguez Hills? What about uh, East Bay? Yes, you can, there are, there are fine programs in each and every one of them. The question is, is that are there enough fine programs and enough of these other things that make it fit? This is where, my, I, this is where my wife I, calls me the soul crusher. Yes, Kate. Just a divergent question. If you had a kid on August 4th entering his senior year, where would he be in this process if he was killing it or on time or on schedule or? Wait a minute, I'm sorry, he's gonna be a senior or he's already graduated? I, I all, these, all these kids on the call, I'm assuming these parents are have entering seniors. Yeah. In your mind, where would an entering senior be right now in this process? Oh, confused. Writing essays. <laughs> yeah, very confused. And Probably. the starting starting to uh, think about essays. 
Um, I just made a video. I finished editing last night, right? I've got a YouTube channel where I put up things about essays or college. And it was, what if Nike wrote your college application essay? Um, and I just started my college cohort uh, Sunday. The very first class was Sunday. And they, um, right, I'm seeing some of these kids' essays and these kids' essays are like, I'm so great, I'm so wonderful, I'm this and I'm that. And that's not what colleges wanna see. They want to see some humility and they want to see that you have the capacity to learn and they have that. So a kid that's got the essay has their EQ, their emotional intelligence kind of figured out. Um, they've got 25 schools that they're superficially looking at and they're starting to dig in a little bit deeper into some of these data points that we talked about. Um, they've already visited West Valley or De Anza or Mission, it doesn't make any difference. Go visit a JC, see what that is like, right? The, the term that many people will say is high school plus. It might be the perfect fit for some people, but I get an idea. You don't need to go do a tour. Just go check that out and say, yep, kind of feels like my school. Then go visit San Jose State. See what San Jose State has become like. And you wanna visit between the hours of like 11 and one. And these are all local visits, right? This is cheap before you spend money to go visit Boston and Michigan and, you know, try and try and get to some of these places, right? It's a, it's expensive now. Um, so you're, um, you've gone to San Jose State, then you drive up to Stanford. I grew up in Menlo Park. I don't actually like Stanford. Uh, I don't like the campus because it's so big, it's a town, but that's me. That's why I don't pick colleges. I've had a lot of other kids that said camp, Stanford's the perfect place for me. Um, then you can go up and if you're, if, if you're wired that way, go check out Berkeley, right? Get an idea of what that one looks like. Um, try and drag your kids up to Sonoma State. So while they're taking the college tour, you're wine tasting. Then you got a three hour drive south. You can go check out Cal Poly. Uh, kids, try and convince your parents to go to Disneyland so you can check out US, uh, USC, UCLA. Then go to SeaWorld in San Diego and make certain you check out UC San Diego and San Diego State. So you can, you know, go visit a handful, that's more, that's 10 colleges, 12 colleges, and not have to get on a plane to go visit. And you might be saying, Kate, you might, Kate, you might be saying, Mike, yeah, my kid doesn't want to go to school here. Great. But wouldn't it be uh, so ideal to get a bunch of data points in terms of, I like this style campus. I don't like this style campus. I like this the way this one feels. I don't like the way that one feels. So that when you do go vest some big money to go visit schools in Boston, New York, and Michigan, he's gonna be able to walk on the campus and go, yeah, okay, this has that feel that I'm looking for. Um, because if you make Michigan your very first stop, oh yeah, that's awesome, I wanna go here. We just have anything to compare it by. So where would kids be on August 4th? They are understanding who they are emotionally so that they can communicate that in an essay and then know what the colleges want in that essay. They have a handful of colleges that they're really starting to dig into and then they've already done some visits so that they know what, what, they, um, what they're looking for when they get there. Uh, I always make the, uh, the, the comparison that when you're checking out houses, right? If you've got only one child your demands for a big house are maybe not as great and you don't need multiple bathrooms and multiple bedrooms and you don't need the biggest kitchen. If you are someone that loves to cook and entertain, you can't have a galley sized kitchen. It's got to be the big. So you have to go look for homes that fit the things that you want. And the only way that you do that is by checking out a lot of homes. We probably looked at for two years, you know, on weekend walks in downtown Willow Glen. I had an apartment. We just would walk and check out homes and we finally found the one that like, oh, this is it. And then five years later, we tore it down and built the one we wanted, but that's a different story. We outgrew it, right? We, at least we lasted five years. So that's where I would say, Kate, those three things, understand my emotional intelligence, be decent on the college search and already have a bunch of data points in my head. So when you do spend the thousands of dollars to go visit, it's not a big waste of money. Super insightful, thank you. And I have, like I said, I on my newsletter thing, there's an entire it's got to be 3,000 words on how to convince how him to stay focused, focused when he's doing, when he's on that campus visit.
Kevin. Hey, Mike, I have Kevin. a question. Mm. Yeah, this is Joe. Mm. Oh, I'm sorry, Joe. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Joe. That's okay. Um, so a couple things. If we are looking at colleges and we want to make sure they're diverse or that they have, you know, resources for kids that have special needs or something like that, is that one of the sort of search functions on a couple of those websites you shared? Now you got to dig a little yeah, bit a little deeper. Deeper. Ooh, there's some feedback. I'm just going to mute. Or would you mute yourself and then there we go and ask away whenever you want. Um, so University of Arizona has a great program for kids with neurodivergent needs and learning learning differences. Right. So that's always one to check out. There are that 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 is a. It's not an involved Google search um, because those campuses want to be known for that. You know, hey, what? Give me the list of give me a list of schools that help with this issue, and you're going to get a lengthy list. Not all of them are good because it was just someone wanting to perform SEO, search engine optimization, that ranked at the top. But what it is is that you can at least find one or two schools. Then you can say, hey, what are schools just like University of Arizona for this? And that's how you kind of expand out on your college search. It's there's. I, I've not seen a really great website that I would trust and say, oh yeah, just go right there. That's going to give it. But within two hours, you're probably going to get 50 schools to look at and you're better than any search engine that that's um, positioned itself as the, the expert. That's awesome. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? And Okay, if there are no other questions, I won't bore you any longer. So for the, I know there's some people that are freshmen, sophomore, juniors, rising freshmen, sophomore, and juniors. Um, I th I'm hoping that you found some value to this, even though this is not directly related to you today. This just sets you up for in the future. You know, we learn through what's called f uh, frequency and duration, right? How often I see the material and how long I see it.